Bingo. All right. Good evening, everybody. It's so wonderful to be back here in our Musser Mondays. Uh, this is we're actually beginning. Uh, September, I believe, will be our fifth year, the beginning of our fifth year of this of this uh, program. Really an honor and a privilege to be part of this incredible group of growing Jews. And uh, I got a phone call today from a uh, doctor from Atlanta who's been following our Musser group for, for, a lot, for a long time. And he had some specific questions to talk about in preparation for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. I thought it was very, very special. Um, so my dear friends, we are, uh, we're up to the, we're in the 16th chapter of the trait of Tahara. Tahara is the trait of purity. And like we discussed last week. Um, oh, by the way, Rabbi, I did listen to this class. Which one? Last, I'm, I'm sorry, last week's class. So I'm, I'm up to speed. Oh, terrific. Excellent. Yeah, it was a great class. I'm glad I listened to it. Thank you. Thank you so much. So last week, we actually covered a lot of grounds. Covered a lot of ground last week. All right. So we talked about what it means to be pure, right? And Ramchal clarifies how we are, uh, we are to view an action that is done primarily with worthy intentions but with a minor ulterior motive. And that's what he, we, that's how we ended off last week discussing, you know, you could do a great action. It's such a good deed, but you do it because you have an ulterior motive that uh, either it could be because you want honor. It could be because it makes you feel good, right? I, you know, so it's so basically, you know, it's like, I always wonder when people, uh, when people give charity only to institutions that they benefit from. Right, it's a very interesting decision that sometimes people make. But either way, Ramchal here we're on page three fifteen on top. Ramchal clarifies his intention, and he says as follows: Now I do not say that anything other than this perfect service service will be completely rejected by Hashem. Right? For the Holy One, blessed is He, does not withhold the reward due to any creature. So it means even if we did it for the wrong intention, a good deed is still rewarded. And He rewards all actions according to their value. It says, however, it is about the perfect service of Hashem that I am speaking. Which is appropriate for all who truly love Hashem. And it is clear that nothing can be described with this title or per, uh, of perfect service. Now again, we're, we're not talking about what it means means to just be a good person. I just want to be a good person. Do no harm, right? That's the medical uh, uh, motto, right? Do no harm. That's your first, that's your primary job is do no harm. Okay, that's not what it means to be a perfect Jew, to be a perfect, uh, 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 righteous person, right? We're talking about how do we get up there to be at the level of perfection? This is the trait that, that's required, not good enough. Good enough isn't good enough for someone who pursues perfection, right? As long as I did it, who cares how, who cares, right? That's not, that's not the attitude of someone who, who aspires for perfection. And it is clear that nothing can be described with this title of perfect ser service other than service that is completely pure. Shalot barach. Whose focus is exclusively on serving Hashem and on nothing else. On nothing else. So imagine this. Imagine that you have someone who all that they desire is to serve Hashem and to serve nothing else. Not to serve themselves, not their ego, not their feel goodness, 
not the, not to show off to their neighbors, not for any other purpose but to serve Hashem. In fact, who was who was defined like this? Who was defined as a perfect servant of Hashem? Moses. Moses' eulogy is the shortest eulogy ever spoken about any person. The shortest. It says, and Moshe died, a servant of God. In Hebrew, it's two words. Evet Hashem, a servant, a servant of Hashem. That's it. What does that mean? That means that Moshe didn't do anything out of his own personal uh, animosity towards someone. He, you know, the big question comes up about Korach, right? Remember Korach? There are a lot of Korachs running around this world. Okay, a lot of them. Okay? Korach was a communist. Okay? Korach was a communist. Right? You see that Moshe prayed for the people who bowed down to who created the golden calf for forgiveness. He prayed for the Jewish people with all of the mistakes. He prayed after the, the um, mistake with the, with, the, uh, with the spies. He prayed after they were complaining. He prayed. I mean, every single turn of the Jewish people that went sour, he prayed on their behalf. God, forgive them. God, forgive them. God, forgive them. Okay, 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 right? Comes Korah. Moses turns to God. He says, get rid of this guy. Oh, he was afraid of his competition? No, he wasn't. There is evil, and evil needs to be eradicated. Evil needs to be eradicated. Communism doesn't demand equality. Communism decides that you don't have the right to be successful. That's communism. That's Korach. And that there's no tolerance for. We see that God listened to Moshe's recommendation. And what did he do? He had the ground open up, open up and swallow up Korach and his whole and his whole group. Now, had Moshe had one tinge of personal, you know, animus towards Korach, one ounce, it wouldn't be pure. And it would have, probably wouldn't have happened. But Moshe had nothing in it for himself. He was a complete and perfect serv servant of Hashem. And as a servant of Hashem, there was only one thing that he wanted. What is the best for Hashem? We can summarize every interaction we have, everything that, we, that goes on in our lives. Is this good for Hashem or bad for Hashem? Is it good for Hashem or bad for Hashem? And I think that if we look at it like that, I think um, it, it helps clarify a lot of our confusion that we have. It'll help remove a lot of the obstacles that are in our way. You know what? Is it good for Hashem or bad for Hashem that I fill in the blank? And if it's good for Hashem, right? Without the ulterior motive, without, well, it's good for Hashem, but bad for me. So, well, Am I on the, on the other side of Hashem? Am I opposing the will of Hashem? This is the trait of purity. The trait of purity is where we are 100% aligned with the Almighty's will. Where we take out our own personal motive. Where we take out our own personal agenda. The more an action is distant from this level, to the extent of its distance, will it be the will be the extent of its deficiency as a service of Hashem? Uh, the commentary here on the bottom, twenty-three. Every mitzvah that one performs is evaluated on two levels. It's a very important fundamental principle here. Every mitzvah that one performs is evaluated on two levels. Number one, the degree, the degree to which it is a fulfillment of Hashem's command. And two, the degree to which it is considered an act of avoda, of service to him. Like the sacrificial avoda, the sacrificial offerings in, in the temple. The former 
evaluation is based on proper physical execution of the act, while the latter evaluation is based on the degree of sincerity with which it was done. When a mitzvah is carried out properly, but the intention is not completely lishma, it's not completely altruistic, the person is rewarded for fulfilling Hashem's command. Nevertheless, it does not rise to the level of being brought up with favor upon his altar. One who aspires to be a servant of Hashem cannot be satisfied with such an action. And that's how our sages explain that yes, it could be that it's a perfect deed, but not with a perfect motive. So you'll get reward for it, but it's not going to be, you know, you know, a one of those, one of those gifts or one of those uh, rewards that goes on the top of God's upper altar. Okay, are we good here? We're on the same page, everybody. Terrific. David Amelach, King David declared his complete dedication to this level divine service with no hint of personal interest. This, in, it is the, exactly, precisely the concept of King David, where he expresses that he expresses when he says in Psalms 73, verse 25, whom else do I have in heaven but you? And with you, I wish for nothing else on earth. I, what does King David want? Nothing but a connection to Hashem. He wasn't carried away by money. He wasn't carried away by his kingdom, by power. No. I want, right? I wish for nothing else on earth, just to be with you. Right? You know, it's it's amazing in, in the uh, in these uh, weeks preceding Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, from the beginning of, of the month of El, we say a psalm, which is La David Hashem Ori, to David, uh, La David for David. And we say, Hashem Ori, Hashem is my light, the Yishi, and my, my, uh, my uh, Savior. What do our sages explain? What's going on in this? You say, I want to share with you one of the verses. I have one request, but one request from the Almighty. This is my request, King David says. Shifti bizeit Hashem kol yemei chayai. Let me sit in the house of Hashem all the days of my life. Hashem to see the greatness of God and to visit in his dwelling. And our sages ask, what do you mean? You're asking two opposite things. You're asking to sit. Who sits? A resident. You sit. You own a house, you become a resident, right? He wants to dwell. He wants to sit in the house. Shifty, baby. I want to dwell in your home. And then he says, to visit in your dwelling. To, to, wait, wait a second. Do you want to become a resident or do you, want to, do you want to visit? Which one? So our sages explained beautifully that what King David was asking for, he said, I want to also live in Hashem's palace. But what I also want is for it to be fresh like the first time. You know, the first time you go to look at a house and you're like, wow, this is so beautiful, right? What happens the hundredth time you pass by those windows and those, and those drapes and the carpets and the couches and all of the, right? Eh, right? Eh. No, that's, that's because, because you've come, become too much of a dweller. You've become too permanent. King David says, I don't want to become permanent where I'm no longer excited. I don't want to become permanent where I'm no longer motivated and, 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 and energized. But rather, I want to be a dweller who's always like a visitor. 
where it's always fresh. It's always exciting. It's always like the first time. And that's something for us to aspire to. It says that the relationship that a man has with his wife is a, 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 a similar a comparison relationship that a man has with the Almighty. A man's responsibility is to be selfless for his spouse. A man's relationship with God is to be selfless for God. Where I don't do it for my own motive, I do it for the motive of, of my connection with God. Where I don't bring my wife a drink because I'm thirsty and I'm already getting a drink, so I'll get her a drink as well. No, but I should already have the intuition to know she might be thirsty before I even need a drink for myself. Let's, let's, let's switch the table now, right? Let's reverse, right? How about we only think that we need a drink because we're worried about her that she needs a drink? The Almighty commands us mitzvahs that bring us closer to him. But we can do them two different type of ways Ramchal is teaching us. We can do them because it makes me feel good. I'm getting a drink. It'll be nice. It's, you know, the chivalry. Oh, would you like a drink as well? Oh, I feel all good. No, 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 no. That wasn't lishma. That was, al- that was not altruistic. You were getting yourself a drink. You also got me a drink. It's very nice. Thank you very much. But that's not the highest level out there. You know what the high level will be? When you don't even want to drink but you're thinking out of yourself to be there for someone else. The ladies are nodding their head. The men are like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I was just going to say, this is the difference between men and women right here. (laughs) You agree, right, Bobby? Absolutely. I'm reading your, I'm I'm reading your lips and your, 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 your microphone is off, but Susan, you, Susan agrees. I put it off. (laughs) so the truth is is that this is our our job men we have a big job right i had a phone call sometime in the past 24 48 hours from from a young man telling me about his struggles in his marriage and i said to him look marriage is meant to be a a a workshop in character development. You don't like that workshop? You want to pull the lever and just get out? Then you're the same loser like everyone else, right? Who runs away from their problems, right? Now, I'm not saying that anybody who's ever gotten divorced is a loser. I'm not saying that. But I'm just saying that that to this individual, all he needed to know is that this is your responsibility. Your responsibility is to work through this and make it work. Don't run away from your problems. I tell young guys before they get married, I said, I just want you to know, you know, the exit signs that they have on top of doors in all public places. I said, in marriage, there's no exit sign. Forget it. You're in and you're locked. Now figure it out. Make the best of it. Imagine you were stuck on an elevator for 70 years with your wife. Do you think you'd figure out how to work it out? I think you'd figure it out. But what? People always think when there's an exit sign, maybe I just just walk out the door. No, no, no. There's no exit sign. Figure it out. Okay? So, is is Tommy getting upset at me for saying No, he missed the whole thing. He was upstairs. Yeah, get back here, Tommy. Get back here. Rabbi, say it again. I have a speaker, so. so... so she's pointing again. She's always pointing at me. She's <laughs> like, no, no, no. You guys are so special. So, I can't and David said as well. Yeah. Your word is very refined, and your servant loves it. The term "refined" is commonly used in connection with precious metals. In, in comparing the world of Hashem, the word of Hashem to such metals, King David states that it is very refined. 
Because in reality, the true service of Hashem must be much more refined than even pure gold and silver. For it must reflect the purity of the word of Hashem. Purity. There's no motives. It's just love. It's just love. When someone is committed you know think of a bride and groom yesterday i was at a wedding of a bride and groom you know, I, was, I was invited to the wedding so of course i wore my mask the whole time right the only one wearing a mask i was like you know there's like when you have like this uh, you know i wasn't a celebrity because they were making fun right but if you have a celebrity right everyone comes they want to take a picture i was like the weirdo that they want to take a picture with the guy wearing the mask okay that was me okay so I'm wearing, I'm wearing the mask and I, you know, there's a young couple there and they, they, on their wedding day, it's so special. And they're all, you know, bright eyed, bushy tailed. They're like all excited. Like everything is going to be, they don't have no clue of what they're in for. Right. My father would always see young couples and he'd say, oh, I have so much mercy on them. Right. <laughs> he said, I would never want to start this over again. So they're much better off being 30, 40 years in than starting from the beginning. <laughs> What's the idea? The idea, though, and what there is something very beautiful to learn about a young couple is that you see purity. You see purity. You see, and that's why people get very emotional by a chuppah. Right? Why do people get so emotional? Because what they see is they think about one second. That was me when I got married. Yeah. I saw so much potential. I saw so much, so much that could happen. And where did I let myself down? Where did I let my, my spouse down? Right? There's so much because there's that, that sense of like, I'll do anything for you. How many guys after they're married 10 years would say, I'll do anything for you? Right? I'll do anything. Or 20 years or 30 years, except for Tommy. Tommy will always say that. Right, but but how many people would would actually say that? I'm sure I've had someone call me. He says the only choice I'll give my wife is what bullet to shoot her with. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You know what they say about in-laws in Texas, right? What happened? What do you do if you miss your in-laws? You reload and shoot again. Yeah, re-aim. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I love my in-laws. Okay, but either way. For those of you who are watching this online and, and, and you have no idea what we're talking about, we're actually in Texas, right? So if they're like in, 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 in New Jersey, they're like, what's, what's that, right? What's going on? So I'm just explaining, okay? Everything is fine. Everyone is safe. But either way, the idea here is that we are, how do we attain purity? How do we attain purity? Purity is when we don't have other motives. We don't do something because we want something. We don't do something because I benefit from, from something. We do it because this is the right thing to do. I don't care if it's not popular. I don't care if my friends will all say, oh, well, what's wrong with you? I, I'll tell you, I was, I was at a, I, you know, I mentioned this before. I buy my wife flowers every Shabbos, every Friday for Shabbos. As to the best of my ability, last week I actually bought it on Tuesday, because we were expecting a hurricane. I'm like, who knows what's going to happen? I was in the store on Tuesday, I saw flowers. I came home, I said, Zahava, this is for Shabbos, because I don't know what's going to be before Shabbos, if there are even going to be stores uh, with the storm that we were, we were anticipating. So, so I remember one Shabbos, we were together in Florida at a convention. And it's, it's coming to, it's Friday afternoon. And what do I do every Friday afternoon? I get my wife flowers. And I'm in a hotel with about three, 400 couples there in the hotel as well. And there's nobody selling flowers there. So I went on my phone and I had a rental car and I went on my phone and I searched for the nearest florist. And I, uh, I went and I bought, I bought, I bought my wife a, a beautiful bouquet for Shabbos with a vase. And when I came back into the hotel, 
a bunch of guys were standing there and they're like, thank you very much. You had to ruin our lives now. <laughs> like, you know, it's like, thank you. You're, you're going to be going to be that guy, right? My wife is going to see you walking out. And she's like, you see, he was able to get his wife flowers, but you weren't able to get your, right? You know what? Our sages tell us do the right thing and don't worry about what people will mock you or laugh at you or ridicule you. Do it for the right, do it for the right reason. Do it for the right, the right purpose. And don't give a care about what they say. But also, a person has to do it for, the, for, for themselves not to have a motive. Not only from outside, inside. What's if I have a motive? You know, it's, a, yeah, it's, what's, it's a true story. True story. I was walking out of Costco once. And the guy, when, you know, they check your, they check your, uh, your, your, uh, your receipt. <laughs> so the guy sees the flowers and he says, boy, how much trouble are you in that you need to get such nice flowers? <laughs> like, this is hysterical. He's like, boy, what do you have to make up for? Right? No, no. I said, no, I'm here every week. I get my flowers here, but thank you very much. So they were really, really beautiful flowers. Either way, so a person has to do things for the right reason. Not because there's a motive. Not external, not internal. Because God told me to do it. That's the purest service of Hashem. The purest service of Hashem is they do it because Hashem said so. Not because I like it. Not because it's my favorite mitzvah. Oh, I love lighting Shabbos candles, therefore I'll do it. No, I do it because Hashem commanded me, and that's why. Okay? He be'emes ha'avodah amitis tzrichel yos tzrufa. Oh, so he says, v'hu ma'ashunem ha'otor, and this is the meaning of what is stated regarding the Torah in, I believe it is, Psalms 12, 7. Imros Hashem Amoros Tahoros Kesef Tzoruf Ba'alila Oretz Nizukok Shvasayim. Right, the words of Hashem are pure words, like refined silver, refined silver, Clear to the world, purified sevenfold. All right? Our sages tell us here, the commentary, number 25 on the bottom. Since the Torah is the height of purity and refinement, one's fulfillment of its commandments must also be absolutely pure, without a trace of ulterior motive. Otherwise, those, de those deeds are not an accurate reflection of, of the word of Hashem. So imagine this, right? Imagine... Um, a, 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 a Jewish person is supposed to be reflective of the Torah, of the relationship with God. If a Jewish person doesn't act in a proper way, if a Jewish person doesn't act in a way that represents that, that is what we call a chilul Hashem. That is a desecration of God's name. Why? Because you should be representing God. Instead, it's a desecration. Someone looks at you and they say, hey, look at this Jew. Look how they're cheating. Look how they're, they're skipping the line. Look at them, how they don't follow the laws. Look at them, how they cheat in business. Look, at, God forbid, right? So a person needs to be just like God is pure. His Torah is pure. Us who learn the Torah should also be pure. And act in a pure way and fulfill it in a pure way. I want to tell you an amazing idea. Tommy, this one's for you, okay? You know why? Because you're sweet like honey. You're sweet like honey. I'm going to tell you something about honey. And we're soon going to dip the apple in the honey, right? So let me tell you an amazing idea. It says, Misuki midvash venofes tsufim. The words of Torah are sweet like honey, right? And like a honeycomb. Honey is very sweet. Do you like honey? Of course, we're like, everyone loves honey. It's delicious. So what's so unique about honey that the Torah is like honey? Let me tell you an amazing thing. Uh, Tommy, you went to dentistry school, right? I went you have to what? Friends? To dentistry went school. To dentistry. You went to dental school. Oh, yeah. Dental school, right? Did you have any friends that went with you to dental school? Yeah. Yeah. Did you know them? You knew them before they went to school with you, right? Some of them. Uh, one, two... Nobody? You made friends there? A dental school? Yeah, I, I knew some of them before. All right. Any of them were perfect human beings? 
besides me? Aside for you, of course, aside for you. <laughs> no. No, right? So let no. me ask you a question. How long were you in dental school? Four years of dental school. Two, there you go. Two so four of years of dental school. Did any of your friends, not yours, you went in perfect, so you went out perfect. But the other people, if you had an angry guy who went in, when they left four years of dental school, did they change and become not a non-angry dentist? No. No. Be because no, I, I your traits no. don't. Right? They, they didn't change. No. They went in angry, they went out angry. All they gained in dental school was now had a clean teeth, had a fixed teeth, and whatever it is that they specialized in, right? <laughs> but nothing changed in who they were. Same thing with right. lawyers, the same thing with doctors, all, you know, regular medical doctors. Um, uh, anyone you, you see in any trade, someone who goes to become a, an accountant, right? They don't become now a perfect human being, right? They become, they gain more knowledge, but nothing changed in the essence of who they are. Not so with Torah. When someone immerses themselves in Torah, our sages tell us that it is known that it, it's known to us. Meaning it, it's part of the rules of nature that when someone immerses themselves in Torah, they become a new person. A completely new person. And their sages bring proof to it. Uh, you know, honey is a very, very powerful food. It's in fact, the most powerful food. If you take a piece of pork, pork is trade for you can't eat it, right? If you take a piece of pork and you put it into honey, right? And you leave it in there for an extended period of time, something like six months to a year. I don't, again, I don't recall the exact amount, so I don't recommend you do it till I get the verified uh, length of time. But if you put it in for an extended period of time, you can take it out after and eat it. What? Rabbi, I just said that you can eat pork. You know why you can eat it? Because honey is so powerful that anything that goes into it becomes honey. It removes everything that's in it and everything that's immersed in it becomes it. Our sages tell us, you know what's compared to, to honey? Torah. If you go into Torah, you learn Torah, you go into yeshiva, you go to study, you know what happens? You become sweet like the Torah. And just like we said over here, like the Torah is pure, so too we become pure when we learn Torah. Not just a little bit here, a little bit there, but when a person immerses themselves in Torah, we discussed this numerous times, that immersing ourselves means uninterrupted Torah time. To become immersed in it, where there's nothing else that exists in our world. I remember when I was in yeshiva, one of the goals that they set for us in yeshiva was that we should wake up at least once in our time in yeshiva and have nothing else in the world that exists other than the study of Torah. That was one of the goals that they set for us. You wake up in the morning, and the only thing you think about is Torah. And there's only one way to get there, is if the only thing you go to sleep with at night is Torah, is that your, your, your mind is completely consumed and immersed by the study of Torah. That brings a purity, hopefully. Hopefully I can merit to that one day. Right, like where Amchal is teaching us here. So where Amchal is saying here, the implication of this analogy the me shehu obeyed Hashem be'emes, and one who is a true servant of Hashem, lo yistapek b'ze b'muat, will not be satisfied in this endeavor of refining his actions with a small measure. Lo yisratzo l'kachas kesef me'orah b'sigim u'bdilim, and will not, and will not be willing to accept silver mixed with dross and base metals. Right? Someone who's looking for silver wants silver. Don't give me other, you know, other pieces of, uh, of, of, of scrap metal. Right? That is any service that is mixed with improper motives. 
Rather, he will strive, he will strive for a level of service that is properly refined and pure. The Oz Yikari Ose Mitzvah Kimamara. Then he will be considered one who performs a mitzvah in accordance with its words, meaning by the command of Hashem, exactly how God wanted it. Sheolav Amru about whom the sages of blessed memory said in Tractate Shabbat 63a, Kalaosa Mitzvah Kemaamara, Ain Mevasrimo Besuros Rose. Anyone who performs a mitzvah in accordance with its words, meaning with its exactness, with its perfection, will not be informed of any Ill, evil tidings. Right? If you compare that, our sages tell us an amazing thing. That if a person just takes one mitzvah, one mitzvah to perfect that one mitzvah. To perfect one mitzvah, to bring it to its completion. Right? Our sages bring many examples of people who had, you know, just, it was just like, you know, a little custom, a little something, but they did it to perfection. Unbelievable reward, unbelievable protect, protection comes upon such people. The Chain numbers of Chonel of Rokh are sages of blessed memory, similarly said in Tractate Nidarim 62a. O said Varim Lashem Paolam, fulfill the words of Torah for the sake of their maker, with Daber Bohem Lishman, and speak about them, study them for their own sake. And our sages say here, just as his actions are purified, of any dross, so will the tidings he receives be free of anything negative. Alternatively, just as he performs the mitzvah not only properly, but also with pure intentions, so is he protected not only from evil occurrences, but also from tidings that cause him, that could cause him mental anguish. So not only that he himself is protected, but not even to cause him any pain or any thoughts of, of anguish. Right? Do the mitzvahs for the sake of the one who made everything for his honor and study the Torah for the sake of knowing and understanding it, not for self-promotion. We study Torah so that we can know the word of Hashem. Not so that people will look at us and say, ooh, Rabbi Tom, what a scholar. Right, what a sage. That's not why we do it. We do it so that we connect and internalize the message of Hashem, the message of God. All right. How are we doing, Dave? Dave, we're good. Ron, you had a question. Yeah, so the takeaway is instead of going to Yeshiva for 15 years, 15 hours a day. Just have a spoonful of honey, right? Uh, you could do that. <laughs> you could, it'll make you sweeter physically, but we want to become a sweeter spiritually, right? I don't so, think it'll help. <laughs> no, it absolutely will. I'm telling you, it's magic. It really is magic. You know who proved that? You know where it says that, that, that it's known that someone who goes to learn Torah becomes a different person, a new person. You know where it says that? It says that about Rabbi Akiva. That's funny. Rabbi Akiva was 40 years old. You knew more than Rabbi Akiva knew when you were 40 years old. You know that? No. Yeah. <laughs> I Every know. one of us knew more than Rabbi Akiva knew. He didn't even know the alphabet. Mm -hmm. He didn't even know the alphabet. David, you knew the alphabet. Come on. I, I could even count to 10. There you go. And, and, and Akiva didn't even know that. And his father, her, her father, Rachel's father, she, he married Rachel, right? And he was, uh, his, her father was very upset that, he was, that she was marrying this ignoramus. And he was very disappointed with her. So what did he say? He said that if you indeed go through with this marriage, I am removing you from my will. And I will not allow you by oath to, to take any pleasure from my possessions. Now, 24 years later, 
where the Kiva comes back and he has 24,000 students. And what did his father do? His father, of course, his father was a wealthy man. Her father was a wealthy man. He welcomes Rabbi Akiva and his students into his home. And our sages say, wait, 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 wait. Did he nullify his vow, his oath? Did he, because he swore that he would not allow Akiva, the shepherd, to enjoy from his possessions. Our sages say he didn't need to nullify his vow. Why? Because he was talking about a different person. He was talking about Akiva, the shepherd, not Akiva, the scholar. And we know that anyone who goes to learn Torah, they become a different person. And therefore, he wasn't talking about this Rabbi Akiva. He was talking about Akiva, the shepherd. It's a different person. Yeah, it might be a similar, similar facial expressions, similar, similar, it, 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 similar. It's not the same person. It's a different person. Reish Lakish, from a robber baron to a Rebbe. That's right. That's right. And we see stories like this of transformation where people, the only, there's only one ingredient. There's no magic. The magic is Torah. You show me a person who went to sit and learn Torah, I will show you that person changed. A hundred percent. There is, is, you get your money back guaranteed. Someone who immerses themselves in the study of Torah will change. You know why? Because the Torah is not only like honey. What makes honey so amazing? It's purity. Honey shouldn't have any other additives. It shouldn't have any other preservatives. It shouldn't have anything. It should just be honey. That's what Torah is. Torah should be unadulterated. Torah should be without any filters, with pure Torah. What do you look in this week's Torah? All of these weeks that we read, the past couple of weeks, the coming weeks, if you look in this week's Torah portion, just open up a regular Chumash. You don't have to be a scholar. You don't have, just open up and read it in the English. And you'll be blown away by the commandments of the Torah. You start asking yourself questions. One second. Why would God care about this? And why would God care about that? And why? start asking those questions. And you'll so be, why, aren't for an amazing surprise. why aren't women then encouraged to uh, study Torah as well? They are, absolutely. Now, the women don't have an obligation it's not that they're not encouraged. They don't have an obligation to learn Torah. And why is that? Why don't women have an obligation to learn Torah? Because they're more spiritual. And because they, they, they have an innate connection with the Almighty. We okay. need to be tied down to a minion three times a day. We need to be tied down to learning every day. We need to be tied down because we're the animals that need to be need to be, uh, you know, uh, you know, with the yoke around our neck, you know, with the, with the blinders on the side, right? And focus. Focus on what's important in our relationship with Hashem. Women don't need that. Women have that naturally. Good it explanation. doesn't mean that every woman is a saint. It doesn't mean that every woman is, is, is a holy, righteous woman, right? But women, generally speaking, are more holy. Thank you. Okay. Very good questions. Thank you. Purity of heart requires great effort. Oh, we can finish the chapter today. Okay. Purity of heart requires great effort. The pursuit of this level of divine service is what is chosen by those who serve Hashem wholeheartedly. Again, the pursuit of this level of divine service, meaning purity, is what is chosen by those who serve Hashem wholeheartedly. It means someone who serves Hashem with their full heart, they say, I just don't want to be with full heart. I want it to be with a pure heart. <speaking in Hebrew> because one who has not yet attached himself to Hashem with true love, this refinement of his, of his divine service will be a strain and a great burden to him. For he will say, who can endure this? 
Vanachnu bnei chomer yulude isha. Why we are mere physical beings born from a woman, born of a woman. E efshalagila zikuk ve'atzeruf hazeh. We cannot achieve this high level of purification and refinement. Om nom ohave Hashem v'chafetz avodos. So, however, those who truly love Hashem and desire His service, ine sameach libam laharos amunas avosam lefan of Yisbarach. They rejoice at the opportunity to demonstrate the faithfulness of their love before Hashem. Blessed is He. And to exert themselves in their personal refinement and purification so that they may serve him in purity, in Tahara. And this is what King David himself expressed in the verses in Psalms 119, verse 140. Your, words, your word is very refined which he concluded by saying, the Avdecha Aheva, and your servant loves it, only through the love of Hashem and his word can one achieve the refinement of service worthy of that word. Okay, so again, it's obvious, you know, it's like what comes first, the chicken or the egg, right? A person has to take the first step always. We have to take this first step in, in putting ourselves in a path of growth in a momentum of, of, of wanting to connect to Hashem. Once we get into that cycle of desiring that closeness and serving Hashem, then, only then, we can work on purity. But here's the mistake that many people make. I have heard this dozens and dozens of times, where people say, well, if I'm not doing it with the purity of heart, I shouldn't do it. Mm. Wrong. Do the right thing, even if it's for the wrong reason. It's like saying, I'm not going to be honest because I really don't want to be honest. So if I don't have it with the full heart, I'm not going to be honest. What do you mean? Even if you don't want to be honest, still be honest, right? Dave, what do you say? Dave. All right. Susan, we got to wake him. Dave. It's okay. It's okay. So what happens is... I'm upstairs. I don't know. You, you tell him that I'm picking on him. <laughs> He's so, downstairs. I'm upstairs. I, I don't know what's going on. It's fine. It's fine. So what happens is like this, is that only when a person is already in the service of Hashem, when a person is in the service of Hashem, then we say, okay, the things that I'm already doing, how do I make them more pure? How do I elevate them and make them more holy? That is the goal. That is what we're trying to accomplish. What we're trying to accomplish is, and, and again, don't not do a mitzvah because it's not with the purity of heart. I, I don't really mean it. I don't really feel it, so I'm not going to do it. No, do it anyway. It'll come that the purity will follow. That's what our Mishnah says. Mitok shalolishma balishma. If you do it for non-altruistic reasons, eventually you will lead to be altruistic. That means don't not do it because you don't have the perfect motive. Don't worry about the motive. It'll come. The perfect motive will come. That's our responsibility. So we have one more page here and five more minutes. So let's go for this, okay? Ramchal explains that Tahara, purity of intent, is not merely one more step that a servant of Hashem takes in his service, but it actually is the essence of all divine service. It's not another step. It's the essence of all divine service. In fact, this quality of Tahara of purity is the criterion by which servants of Hashem themselves are measured and distinguished from one another in their respective levels of divine service. Meaning, imagine you have two people who give charity. How will God distinguish who is more righteous? This is the measure. The measure is who did it with more purity. Who did it with more purity? I want to tell you an amazing story. An amazing story. 
there was a there's a, a cemetery in 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 the uh, in Eastern Europe that is very weird. This the, there's a tombstone of two brothers, and on the tombstone it has two halves of one verse. One is kapa porcelani, and that is its spoon he gave to his brother. And the hands he gave to the poor. What does that mean? Two, you have two brothers buried one next to the other. One tombstone which has two halves of the verse. Very weird. So they went into the town and they asked the rabbi, explain to us what's going on here. What's with that tombstone? So the rabbi says, let me explain to you an amazing thing. He says, these two brothers were very, very wealthy people. And one of the things that they loved to do was to give charity. They absolutely loved to give charity. But they weren't always wealthy. And they lost all of their businesses and they lost all of their wealth. And people would come from far and wide when they had money. But not everyone got the memo that they lost all of their wealth. So one time, the two brothers are sitting on the floor of one of their homes because they had no more furniture. They gave their furniture. They loved giving charity. So if someone came here, take the chairs. Here, take the table. And nothing left. They were sitting on the floor. And a poor person comes in not realizing that they had lost all their wealth. And one of the brothers sitting on the floor you know, looks and he sees on the side there is a silver spoon. A silver spoon. So he takes the spoon and he cracks it in half. And the spoon part he gave to his brother. And the hand of the spoon he gave to the poor person. Now why did he give the spoon part to his brother? So that his brother can give it to the poor. They love to give so much. He wanted his brother to have the opportunity to give as well. He found one more spoon hanging around the house. He cracked the spoon, gave the hand to the poor person, and gave the spoon to his brother so that he can give it to the poor person. And that's what that verse is in King Solomon's uh, uh, Proverbs, where he says, Kappa parcel yani. We say this in Eshet Chayel every single week. This incredible song, the women of valor, right? We say this verse, the spoon he gave to his brother and the hand he gave to the poor person. That's the purity of people who really give because they love to give, because they realize it's their responsibility to give to another Jew, to give with all of their heart, right? That's purity. And that's what we aspire for. He says, Kimi libo yoser, for the one who is able to purify his heart more than another, who yoser He is the one who approaches closer to Hashem and who is more beloved by him. Blessed is he. It all goes by purity. Haim Hema Rishonim Asher Aretz Hema. Indeed, these, the ones who are most beloved by Hashem, are the early ones who are long interred in the land, in the earth. Who strengthen themselves and triumph in this matter. Now, what do they call our other sages? They call them the shepherds. Right? King David was a shepherd. King Solomon was a shepherd. Moses was a shepherd. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was a she were shepherds. Right? Joseph and his brothers were shepherds. Why shepherds? Because you need to learn sensitivity. You need to, right? He says, they are the patriarchs and the other shepherds of the Jewish people. Right? It's also that the Jewish people are considered like a herd. Right? And that's why we, our leaders are called the shepherds as well. 
who purify their hearts before Hashem. These exceptional people whose sole focus in life was to do Hashem's will became the role models of servants devoted to Him and beloved by Him. Right? It's very sad when I hear people uh, comment very callously about our patriarchs and matriarchs as if they were human beings living in the 21st century that uh, you know had all these types of uh, hangups and all these different types of motives and all these different types of political leanings you know as if they're making out of abraham just that hey, he was an ordinary guy you know instead of working on wall street you know he uh no this is our patriarch right our patriarchs our sages tell us we're like angels in their perfection of service yes did they make mistakes of course they did but in our eyes we should look at them like like they're angels not like some joe schmo okay so Ramchal continues here. Okay, you know what? We're going to stop here. And next week, we're going to finish chapter uh, chapter 16 and go right into 17. It's also uh, how to acquire the trait of purity. So next week, we'll finish the summary over here, the end of, the, of, the, of this uh, level of, of purity. And then next week, we'll go right into it. My dear friends, have a remarkable day. I wanted to show you something. My son Shlomo was doing some wood woodworking, and look at this beautiful thing that he made here. Wow! Is that yeah. Familiar? Nice. Isn't yeah. that beautiful? <laughs> Maybe I'll put it behind me. Like I'll have like a new. Uh, hey. okay. <laughs> what is it? Rabbi, next, next week. Next week, next week like that he burned it on. Oh, next week we're on. Unless anybody wants to not be here for Labor Day, I'm I'm on. Rain or shine, nothing is going to stop us. The Yetzirah is not going to stop us for anything. Hi, All right, so one second. So for our friends hey, on Bobby. Facebook, thank you so much for joining us. We thank you for being part of our program. Please like and share these videos. Have a magnificent, remarkable, amazing, terrific week.